Welcome to the second half of the uh, first class of uh, one of the coolest classes that I know about in uh, academia on security. Uh, so today, for the rest of the class, we're going to talk about design and operational review. This is going to cover like design flaws, flaws in software that are intrinsic to its nature, and then operational review, some things that can introduce problems, security problems for a program that aren't actually related to the program itself, but the components and the environment around it. My name is Brandon Edwards, and um, yeah. So uh, here's the basic agenda. We're going to cover what design flaws are. I'm going to show you guys some example design flaws, um, some stuff from real-world software that's happened over the last couple of years, that, uh, some of it more popular than others. But um, we're going to talk about how to, find, how to find design problems by doing a design review. It's really sort of like uh, a soft topic, I think. It's, it's more of like abstract thinking about how programs work. But the stuff that you get out of the design review is going to be crucial when you go into doing uh, implementation review, when you're actually like, reading code and looking at how to break the application, the, the sort of the components and the things that you, the observations you make during your design review are going to matter there a lot. So while this isn't necessarily as hardcore as the other stuff we're getting into, it's important to pay attention as it plays a big role in breaking, breaking stuff. Um, when we're going to get into operational security, that's really just a short sort of note on, again, some of the environmental things around applications. So what are design flaws? Uh, to quote the, the, the book that we, we recommend you to read here for the homework tonight, um, The Art of Software Security Assessment, a design vulnerability is a problem that arises from a fundamental mistake or oversight in the software's design. So generally this is something where there was a lack of security forethought. People did not think when they wrote something that this could have a security implication, right? Maybe you, uh, you, you programmed in something to allow users to read files from the file system, but you didn't think about authentication or that maybe only some users should be allowed to do it, so you'd have like an authorization design flaw. Maybe you trust code pushed up by a user and you execute it without thinking there could be security ramifications here. Um, a lot of these can also be a lot more subtle than that. Like there could be really, really small, tiny things that have massive security impact. But the one thing they all, they, they all sort of share is that they're devastating, and we'll, we'll see why. Um, they almost always equal awesome ownage, right? For one, they're reliable. A lot of the bugs we're going to talk about when we get into like implementation review and everything else, um, while they are really fancy, technically impressive, and whatever else, uh, design flaws do not suffer from a lot of the problems that they do. So if you find a design flaw and you're exploiting it, you're not going to have to worry about the pro process crashing because the, the exploit didn't work, right? This, you're not corrupting memory like you will be in some of the other attacks we'll be doing. Um, they have, there's almost no preventive measures against it, right? Like there, there are, there's software out there to detect buffer overflows. There's no software out there to detect programmer stupidity. So if you have something that is intrinsically broken in the application, um, they're awesome for this. Rarely set off alarms and don't crash on fail failure. They're also easily fingerprinted, which is cool. Like you know, you know if a version is going to work or not work. And it's across operating systems. If there's a design flaw in Java, it's going to work on Windows. Like if it's in the Java, like little component processes applets in your browser, it's going to work on Windows. It's going to work on OS X. It's going to work on on everything, right? Because it's it's an implementation issue. I mean, not an implementation. It's not an implementation issue. Sorry, it's it's a flaw in the design, an architectural issue. What's also really cool is that they're difficult to fix a lot of these. So you can find, you can find something that is in the architecture of the application, um, and the whole application would have to be re-architected in order to, to remediate this vulnerability, right? And so they usually hang around for a while when you find them, which makes them great for owning networks, owning systems. Um, and they work well in Symfony. Last point, that being that you can have a lot of small little design flaws and combine them together to get this awesome sort of exploit that will, like, Maybe one thing lets you write to a file, maybe another thing lets you load code from a file, maybe another thing discloses piece of information, and all together you can, get, you can disclose where a directory is to upload a file to, to load code from, and boom, you've owned the whole thing, right? So um, what, what are the type of things that are commonly affected by design flaws? Like, what are you going to be finding these in the software? A big one is authentication, right, right off the bat. Um, these, are, these are like authentication bypasses, ways that authentication where it wants a username and password, but you can find a way around that. Um, or just a lack of authentication altogether. There are portions of something that, that should require authentication if, if somebody with a security mindset hadn't designed it, but it does not. Uh, you have authorization issues. Um, sometimes not properly segmenting privileges among users, right? Or enforcing that a user is allowed or not allowed to have certain, certain privileges. Uh, you'll see it a lot with cryptography. A lot of people don't understand cryptography, and even though they use approved algorithms with approved implementations, they don't use it properly. They design the crypto incorrectly. Think, think, for example, somebody uh, sending an encrypted message with the key along with the encrypted message. If you intercept that message, you also intercept the key, the crypto will give you nothing. It's fancy encoding at that point. That's a design flaw in that, in that protocol, in that communication. Business logic is 
uh, just a generic term to cover pretty much anything that I wouldn't put into these. So whatever the application does, what is the logic of the application? Maybe the application is a website. It stores it's Facebook. It stores profile information about people. And that there is some, some fundamental flaw in how it stores that profile information that lets you overwrite other people's profiles or something. Um, so what is the business logic? What is the application meant to do? And more, how can you make it deviate? But uh, it's, it's real fun design flaws. So here's an example of like an authentication. Uh, how many of you guys have used BNC? I'm guessing a few of you guys. Is that just too old school of a tool? All right. Um, back in my day when you had to write shell code on Abacus, we had this tool called BNC where you could like connect into a box and administrate it. And in 2006, there was this terrible, terrible vulnerability found where you had this null authentication method. When you connected to the VNC server, which lets you share a desktop or whatever, the, the server would say, hey, what, what's your authentication credentials? And if you just said, I'm choosing not to authenticate, it would say, oh, good, well, come on in. And, and that was a flaw. And this is some pseudocode to sort of represent that, right? You'd have a case where, like, use a password. Well, in the case that we use a password, let's get the credentials password, validate the user, and if they validate, then let's set the auth flag to one. If they don't want to use a password, though, let's just go ahead and, and validate them. And so this is a design flaw, right? It's, it's, it's a very simple one to fix, but it's, it's a flaw that, that they designed it incorrectly. It should never have been there. Also sort of borders an implementation bug, but these type of authentication bad classes are, are believe it or not, a lot more common uh, than one would think or hope. Uh, the other thing, a lot of, there's, there's design flaws sometimes cover back doors. Uh, Barnaby Jack presented a year or two ago on, on hacking into ATMs remotely, and that was a design, uh, by design, a piece of functionality in the ATM put there by the vendor. Um, and it was, it was sort of seen as like a back door, right? And because of that, uh, he was able to upload and take over this ATM. Other cases where you'll have like hard-coded passwords for backdoors, it'll set an off flag or whatever else the case may be. Uh, so it's, you know, there's, uh, do you have any questions? Is that, no. okay. um, so yeah, there's, these are some of the things you want to look for is that, you know, if, if applications are architected around these things, they're, they're going to be problems that pervade throughout the whole, the whole application. So another classic example, here's like an authorization issue, right? Uh, I spoke of Java earlier, and I said how if there was a vulnerability in Java would affect, you know, Windows the same as it would affect uh, Mac it, it, in, if it's architectural. This is a bug that happened. It was in the, it's in the calendar zone information uh, portion. Is deserialized. It could be taken from an applet and then deserialized. I don't know. Do you guys know what serialization is of like an object in programming? The idea of like taking taking an object and representing it as a string of bytes so that another piece of code could then deserialize that and represent that object itself. In doing so, though, they would do it under a do privilege block, which basically raised elevated privileges for that object. And by doing so, this allowed the object to do things that otherwise was not privileged to do with some special tricks involved, and ultimately allowed for compromise of the machine. This is an authorization style uh, design flaw. I mean, this is, this is not good. Uh, this was, again, easy to fix, but where, where are these other places? Where do they do this? Why, why would they ever deserialize and do, pri do privilege block? So, uh, and this was also cool, because it was a whole new class of bugs, right? There's no implementation. Well, I guess this might even fall under implementation, but I think it's a design flaw, though. I, people might argue me about this. If you guys want to say mean things on Reddit, that'd be cool. Um, so a lot of these are authorization oversights. Another thing you'll see if you're browsing a website, let's say you log in as user A, and you notice that when you log in as user A, inside the URL you can see slash user A slash profile, right? And you know that Dan has also a profile in there, and his username is Dan. What happens if you type Dan in there? Sure, you had to log in with your username and password to get initial access to the site, but is there anything enforcing that you can't go into Dan's page as Dan? These are authorization design flaws, right? They're, the application's not checking that, that something should or should not be in place for, for a user to get access, right? So authorization is, is granted where it shouldn't be. And again, cryptographic misunderstanding. Somebody hard codes a key or they send a store of the key with the plain text, it's, uh, it's, it's broken. You'll actually see there's a lot of like, there have been cases of software in the past where there's communication between components and, um, and it's encrypted traffic, right? But if you were to reverse engineer one of the pieces of software, you would realize that the encryption is all just using a hard-coded key. And once you have that key, you can decrypt all traffic used by anyone using that software. That's, that's something that they'd have to re-architect the entire program around to change, to get, to get away from. At, at best, they would probably, if the vendor found out, would just re-hard-code -re a new key, right? That's, that doesn't fix the actual problem. The problem's still there, and so that, that shows where you have this issue that's gonna be around forever, especially if it's like a piece of software that has to be legacy, you know, supported by, it's used by people that use old versions you have to support, becomes a huge problem. So uh, looking at these type of things is, is, is gonna be very fruitful in your, uh, in your assessments. So how do we find them? How do we go about doing this? We've seen the type of bugs you can get. You, you wanna know 
what you're going to do. Um, and more importantly than, than just design flaws here, as we go through this process, um, take note whenever you are looking at an application of all the pieces that you do here because the same answers that you get for design flaws and finding design flaws, this is going to tell you where you want to go read the code for implementation bugs. This is where the, these same pieces are going to tell you where to go read to find a, a buffer overflow, an integer overflow leading to, to a buffer overflow or other memory corruption. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you find uh, where SQL injection is or process scripting based on the same, the same sort of targeting process that we're going through here. Am I going too fast? Does anybody have any questions? Young man in the back? All right. Please define the bus decay. <laughs> yeah. So bus decay is to completely uh, obliterate or break into uh, many pieces. Um, it, is, it is to destroy. Did you coin this term? Uh, no, this term was actually coined in, in a pharmacology uh, posting in 1908. Uh, it's, it's on Dictionary Word of the Day, I think, uh, 2009, August 3rd. But, um, <laughs> You think I'm kidding, I'll pull it up right now. Um, all right, so the first step, information collection. Um, so application specs, protocol specs, RFCs, anything you can get about how the application's intended to work is gonna help you right off the bat. This is gonna give you what the developers were thinking when they wrote it, what the customer wanted when they were writing it for the customer, and everything sort of around how the, how the app is intended to function. And knowing these things are gonna be the first thing to give you an eye into the design so that you can start looking for design flaws, logically. Uh, architectural documentation is awesome. That and data flow diagrams. If you can see something, uh, we don't really have a whiteboard or whatever, but basically if you can see, you know, you've got like data coming into a server and it splits off into a database and all this other fancy shit happens, like that, that helps you determine basically, uh, you know, how the application is meant to handle data and sort of what its purpose and business logic is going to be. That lets you, that lets you move on to the next step, right? From there, you go into modeling the application. You now, you've now seen some, some pieces about the information. Okay, so it does this, this action for a user. How does it do that for a user? What, what are the resources that user is using this application for? And more importantly, think of resources as anything as an attacker you would be interested in. Maybe this application stores data in a database, right? It's got all sorts of user information, maybe credit card numbers or whatever else you're after. If it's in there, like it's, it's stored in a database somehow, that's an interesting resource. How does the application use it and, and where, why? Uh, what, what's the control the application gives you access to? Maybe in some cases you don't want data, maybe you want control. Think of like Stuxnet, for example, right? That didn't give anybody access to data, it gave them access to control, control of systems, valuable systems, that's a resource. So think of resources, anything that would be valuable to an adversary or an attacker. In this case, you are the attacker, so you are targeting these things. This is, and you can, you can derive this or infer this by these architectural diagrams that we gathered in step one. All of the resources combined represent every piece of access or data functionality offered by a system. Uh, data and access that I think are transposed, but anyway. Uh, data or access or functionality offers by a system. Anyway, this is the sum of everything as an attacker you're going to be going after while you're trying to, to break this application. So, first step now. We know how to sort of the, the application's laid out, or we've gathered as much intel as we can. And we've sort of looked at resources, right? We're like, oh, that's interesting. It does this, it stores this, controls these things. What's the input you can bring to it? What type of input does it take? Maybe it takes usernames and logins as like the initial form of input, right? Maybe it reads data in, maybe it's like something like an RSS feed read or something, reads data in from RSS feeds, you can influence that, a Twitter aggregator, I don't know, any, any, anything, right? Like maybe it's something that, that scans, maybe if you're attacking an AV engine, it's something that scans every file on disk. That way, every file on disk is now a source of input if you want to attack the AV engine, right? So you, you need to think about these things. You want to track this data flow too, as much as you can. Where does it get the input and how does it use it? How trusted is the data? Does it do any validation on this data? If it gets this data in from some aggregated Twitter feed, how, how does it know that it actually came from Twitter, that those tweets weren't forged? If it gets it off the file system, how does it know that there haven't been file systems mounted inside a file system? I mean, how can it validate what it's looking at? Because how it validates that, it's gonna, or how trusted will determine how it validates it, and how poorly it validates it will, will lead to uh, all sorts of problems. So here's an interesting thought I want you guys to think about, though. You, you model the application. Don't think of just input as anything, as any data. Think of input as any external influence you can provide which affects the program. Anything you can do. If even you bringing up a screen to log into the program causes the program to do something different other than just run its normal loop, you are inputting, you're, you're giving input to the program. You're causing the, input, uh, the program to change its path of execution somehow. And that's something important because the slightest, most subtle change that you can make to a program may have a, a significant impact. Um, and, and keeping these things sort of in context in your head will help a lot. So then let's move on to the next logical step here. We've seen how data gets into the program, and you're sort of tracking how it uses it. What is the output that comes out of this? 
was the output that's generated from your input. What is, uh, you know, what type of data does the output that you, may be a resource that you want to leverage as an attacker? Or what type of output does it give that is sensitive? Maybe it tells you, oh shit, this password didn't work well at all, or we're approaching the password limit, or your password was close, or better yet, maybe you go to log in, and it's like your email that you used to log in was correct, but your password was not. It's just disclosed a piece of information to you. You just learned, uh, that right there is a design flaw. You now know that you have a valid username. If you wanted to attempt completely blind password cracking on it, you now know you have a valid username at least, and now you just need to come up with a good password, right? Output can be just as valuable as input. And in the cases of certain like web vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting, output is, is, is the vulnerability itself. The fact that the application outputs data that you control means you win. In the cases where you can inject data into log files that then you can load as PHP files through other web classes of bugs, output is how you're winning, it's not the input, it's the output generated by the application. Other things to think about with output too are like debugging data. So let's say you, you're attacking something remotely and maybe you're corrupting memory somehow which you guys will learn about later on in the course and it crashes the program but during that crash it writes back all sorts of debugging data to you. It's extremely valuable. So, so you want to look at all the ways that the program can output data and similarly to the input, don't just think of it as like stuff it writes to disk. Think of it as any observation of a program response that can be measured as output. And so that, that sort of gives you more of like an abstract sense of it, and it, it'll play in, as, as you'll notice, you know, in, in the case of blind SQL injection, for example, it's not telling you the SQL query failed, and you'll learn about all this, again, towards the web part of the hacking, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way of attacking an application where you can't actually see the output, but you can see that the application responds slightly differently in one in success rather than in failure, and based off that, you can exploit the application. Um, so, the, uh, now that we've gotten through some of the modeling stuff here, uh, you want to start thinking about external components. Applications are not as much as developers want them to be. They're almost never whole just ecosystems, right? They always have other things they do. They, they talk to databases, they use network services, they use files off of disk, they, they use other components, maybe they use a smart card for authentication that talks to a device that does something. Whatever it is, it's some external component. And you want to take note of that, because maybe that's a point of entry. Maybe there's a weakness there. Maybe that's the bottleneck, the weakest link in the chain, right? You can attack that instead of having to attack the application itself. And maybe that will give you the access or the control or the data that you're looking for. Um, what are the libraries of those? What are the ways that you can influence those? You're not just thinking about the application. You're thinking about the whole ecosystem here, right? Uh, and then user roles. So what are the various user roles that exist? Are all users the same? Is Dan an admin and I'm not? And if so, what are the differences? And what, what does the program do to, to differentiate that? Uh, are there allowed to be levels higher than admins? Are there allowed to be levels of access that are not users? Think about the, the, the null, null authentication method we looked at, where the code was just like, oh, you don't want to give any credits, we'll just log you in. What user was that logged in as? I mean, what, what, what access did that give them? These, these are the type of things, and, and sort of thinking about these user roles would lead you to that sort of design flow. Excuse me. Um, how, how do users identify themselves to the system? How does the system know that it's talking to Dan instead of me or some guy that walks in the room asking about the camera? How does, <laughs> how does, uh, you know, how are privilege levels defined, right? How, how does it know that, that, that Dan's privileges are different than mine? And where are there any places that these user roles are unclear? Maybe that there are, there are shared resources that are accessible by all users. How much of that is accessible truly by all users? And what other resources might sort of fall into that category that shouldn't? And so you want to start not thinking about all these things. You don't just want to think about like user roles and, and external components and all these things separately. You want to start piecing this all together, right? And, and by piecing this together, you can come up with trust boundaries. So now that we know the user roles, and now that we know the resources, and we know where input comes in and type of output the application generates, what are the different ways that we can, we can think about the trust that should be there between these pieces and the trust that is probably not there? Or what are the ways that you would want to attack it? Or what would be advantageous to you to help the application deviate based on a failed trust boundary, right? Maybe it, it shouldn't trust certain data from the database because there are other applications using it as well. And if that, those applications get compromised, the database is no longer trusted. Now if it's pulling credentials or trusting you know, privilege definitions from a database, that data is no longer any good. You've broken the application, not through the application itself, but through a failed trust boundary. Uh, and all right, so what, what's the trust granted to it to other components, right? Like, and what else relies on this application? Maybe. Maybe this application you think is your goal, but it talks to other things, and other things rely on it. And so if you can own this, you can go on to greater ownage, right? 
and that, that, that may help you in your pen test. It may help you pivot onto other systems. Uh, and of course, just like with the user, user roles, are there any areas that are unclear? Is it not firmly defined? Is it not uniformly applied across the application as it should be? Look for any of this unclarity, because this is going to help you. This is going to be a flaw, design flaw, that the developer wrote in, uh, because they did not strictly define how, how trust should be implemented or used, rather. All right, so we reviewed each area, and we combine our observations. And we use this to identify targets. We see, OK, this takes in credentials from this source here, and it talks to this machine here. So you're like, I'm kind of interested to see what they did to design around this credential piece in the middle there that actually handles that. Like, what is the design of how it authenticates? Or what is the design of how it talks to the database? So we, we've thought about this. And I know it sounds cliche, and, and Dan's going to slap me later for saying this, but think like an attacker. Literally. think. Don't just think like what the application does. Think about how you can make it deviate. Think like, oh, it's meant to do this, but it's also capable of doing other things. What can you make it do? Maybe the control of the application, maybe you can't get full control of the application, but that application can be full control of the system through other paths that it can take, right? Maybe by poking and prodding this application, it will poke and prod other things that ultimately cause a, a, an effect that's advantageous for you way over somewhere else. But just think about what are the byproducts of everything that you can do to it. And this is why you want to observe any sort of output, any sort of influence you have over it, and measure these things. Because there will always be subtle ways that you can influence the application beyond how it was designed. There's no way, I mean, we, humans are flawed in writing code, period. So they're going to exist. Um, some of the thoughts to have when you're doing this are, where was security not considered? We see that, all right, they authenticate for this piece of the application. But then there's this other piece that listens over here. And you can also talk to that. And no security was placed there. So why wasn't it? And what can you do with it? Um, what do the security considerations fall short? Maybe they check username and passwords for all of it, but they only enforce that users have to be authenticated for portions of it. Uh, maybe there are edge cases, just sort of little corner cases where you're like, ah, in this condition, if I'm logged in as this user, but somehow this other user is also logged in, for some reason I can talk to this through a design, a design fault, right? These are the things you want to think about when you're looking at the app. Um, yeah. So. Now that you've reviewed the target components, you want to think about all this logic, think beyond the intentions of the developer, and even if you don't find design flaws, even if you're like, okay, this is designed pretty solid, they, they properly use crypto, they use a PKI system, they've actually exchanged certs ahead of time, they know the data that's being spoken between them is legitimate. But all this data that you've now gathered, everything you've drawn up, the entire set of profiling and architecture review and data flow analysis that you've just performed is going to help you own, own the application on implementation all over the place. Because if they, it, it's, it's, it's almost certain that if it's this complex and you found no design flaws, that there are going to be implementation bugs. And when we get into source code auditing next class and the class after that, uh, you're going to see like, that, that these implementation bugs can pop up everywhere. And this is the perfect way to pick targets to go read the code to be like, ah, you, you actually overwrite this data here, corrupt this memory, you, know, you have an integer overflow in this allocation here. And, and based on that, the key points that you want to attack with that, you've determined all through this work already. So it's sort of like a two-step process. Um, I think that's pretty much it for design reviews. Anybody have any questions on the design review stuff? Excellent. Uh, does anybody have any, any gripes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, what is operational review? Operational review, in vulner uh, operational vulnerabilities are the result of issues in an application's configuration or deployment environment. Again, to quote our favorite book on this topic. Um, these are things now that are completely not unrelated to the application, but not fault of the application. They're more fault of the infrastructure that's in place or the admins that deploy the application. So let's go back to an example of like a website. It's got a database. It checks creds in there, right? You're like, okay, this admin has heard of SQL injection, and they actually want to design their app completely differently. Now it uses this new MongoDB thing, and they think they're pretty clever about that. And so they, they store all their creds in here. and. All right, that's great. And the app is really well written. There's no MongoDB injection. There's no, there's no SQL injection, obviously, because there's no SQL. So what are we going to do to attack it? Well, MongoDB, by default, requires no authentication itself. And it listens on this port that's publicly known and speaks a well-documented protocol. So what if I just connect to the box on that port? Is it open? Boom. You've just owned the machine. The application, brilliantly written, deployed terribly. You've just, you've just compromised everything based on a deployment note. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, don't, well, don't. <laughs> Uh, so operational issues, they happen outside the scope of the application as that, as that sort of uh, little little layout gave you there. Um, they're not problems which will be indicated in the source code itself, but they're things you can infer maybe by looking at the source code. So you're like, okay, look, they, they do this, they do this, but it speaks to this component. That's usually indicative of this sort of deployment, right? Like, if you see them talking MS SQL, you know it's on a Windows box. You're not going to be looking for local Unix file location issues, right, or file influence issues. This, this helps you sort of like narrow down your scope. And then look for other things. All right, so what are some common problems with Windows? Well, if they deployed this and it's on MS SQL, it probably maybe also has IIS installed. Maybe there's some bugs there or something or some other applications we can attack. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe if, if you notice it's on a Windows box and it's on a network internal that you're attacking it, you, you feel like, okay, well, it's, it's probably on a domain, so use domain credentials. So if I can get this, maybe I can pivot these credentials elsewhere. Um, there's, you just want to start thinking about the possible concerns that can, that can be inferred by what the application does, not necessarily how it was written or how it was designed, but, but how it's going to be used. So like, a lot of the common ones are like poor configuration, uh, maybe they just left open that, that MongoDB port. Uh, so yeah, open ports, defaults, passwords. Maybe you're looking for just like default scripts left around web servers. It's not so common anymore, but it's more common than you'd, you'd probably want it to be, and it's highly effective at owning stuff. Um, maybe they have anonymous logins and FTP servers if it's 1988. Um, <laughs> maybe they have unpatched components, and you can you can sort of detect what those components might be. So, so like a, a common example, a real world example of this is WordPress was used to compromise tons of machines notoriously over the last several years, and probably still is because it's just not that great. Um, but People will look at WordPress, and even if they don't have a WordPress vulnerability, they'll be like, huh, that's weird. They deployed WordPress, and they're, they're sort of into this Web 2.0 thing. They probably deployed these following WordPress plugins. And so based on that, it has nothing to do with WordPress itself other than its plugin, but you can, you can infer information and go attack those. And the WordPress plugins are even worse than WordPress. Yes, it's possible. So you, like, you, know, you can busticate it that way. Uh, the other thing is like a failure to use techn secure technologies around it. They wrote this kick-ass web application that has no SQL injection. They locked down their MongoDB port, so you're not going to pop that, right? But then they, uh, they, don't, they have lack of SSL and web creds. So you go sit there at the cafe, watch the admin log in, take his creds, you win, right? Uh, these are deployments. These are operational issues. These are, what, what are they, where are they lacking in how, how it was planted and grown into a full application? Uh, poorly generated certificates, maybe bad random data on, on how, it was, how it was generated. Maybe these are things you can sort of influence or, or uh, attack. Uh, Debian's a classic example of this being completely out of your control, but if you knew it was there, you could go own somebody who had generated a certificate with it. But there are a lot of cases where Based, again, remember when I said input is any way you can influence the application? Sometimes when you request a site, just make a request, just to view the page, a site will reseed its random generator in PHP. I've seen this, it's very strange. But what's cool about that is that you know it's being reseeded at that very moment. You can, you can do this with some other tricks, or maybe, maybe you can cause it to influence dev random or whatever. Any sort of trick, if you can throw off the randomization, you can cause bad poor, you know, poor crypto. What, what are the, you know, think abstractly. What are the ways you can affect it that, uh, yeah. And these, these are the operational concerns all around it, right? Um, the other thing about operational review is what are the software security mechanisms they've put in place? So when Dino comes in here and blows everyone's heads apart with awesome exploitation techniques, uh, some of the things we'll probably talk to you guys about are data execution prevention. So it's like, uh, do any of you guys know what that is? Is that kind of like a code segment that's either writable? Uh, it, that's close. It's it's the it's the if it's writable or readable. It's well, if it's writable, it's not executable. Yeah, it's w or <laughs> right, right. So that's 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 like sort of a, a form of. There's various forms of like that same technology, but yeah. And that that basically, as as Ian's going to show you when you're exploiting software, um, you know, because you can execute code off of pieces of memory that a user can influence and write to, uh, it's bad. And, and Debt sort of aims to to make that difficult or not possible, at least in that that sense, right? So. You think about this, or you think about stack cookies, which are another way to sort of prevent uh, certain forms of memory corruption, like stack smashing, basically, or a hardened key for SCH validation. These are all things that if you guys get into Windows exploitation, you will see and, and hear about. And when you think about operational review, you're like, okay, we wrote this app, we had design implementation from, you know, the, the developers were really smart when they wrote it, and there's, you know, there may be some implementation bugs there. Did they deploy it with any of these protections? Because that's going to make determine how difficult it is to attack it. So these are things you want to think about. The other things are just like general policy, right? Like, do they have network segmentation? Do they, do they break boxes up? Is the database on the same box as the web server? Maybe you can pop the Mongo database, but if they segment it properly, it doesn't give you anything. 
Uh, maybe there are, there are bad system user roles. Maybe if you can take, take over a system as any user, you are every user. You are God because they run everything at system because it's 1998. Maybe, uh, maybe, they're, maybe they, they jail things on uh, truths. I don't know if you know, those are like isolated environments for like, for, like Unix and Linux. Um, maybe they have firewalls or application firewalls in place. If they do, like what are they? Also though, when you're doing the operational review, don't always think of these things as negative things if you want to break, so you're breaking into something, you're like da 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 da. It's a web application, it's got a web application firewall in front of it. Oh darn, that means I can't get SQL injection. But what you can do now is go get yourself a copy of that web application firewall, audit it on your own, find vulnerabilities in that, and then pop that instead. That will give you probably just as much access because that thing sits in line on the web server and thus filters all the data, and now you're getting all these credentials as people log in. There's also, so, so when you're doing an operational review, think about the things they're using that both help them and work against them at the same time, such as web application firewalls, or data loss prevention projects, products rather. They'll put those on the network, they'll try to detect when data's being exfiltrated, so like you've taken over a database, you're stealing all this data out of it, oh yeah, you're winning, this pen test is going great, you know, the report's gonna be full of stuff, they got all these like wallcats in there and shit, and then, uh, <laughs> And the DLP blows up, and you're like, oh, that's really, what a jerk. Like, why'd I have to go light, light me on fire like that? Well, DLPs, how do they do this? They parse all this data, right, coming across the network. DLP is probably the, the single greatest thing to attack on a network because you know your input always reaches it because it has to monitor all the network, and you know everything else the network goes to it. So maybe that's, maybe it's, sure, it's a protective measure they put in place that screwed over one of your attacks, but now it is the point of your attack when you come in elsewhere. Um, so yeah. Any, any, other, any, any other questions, or am I just babbling away up here? People awake? All right. Um, so think about how it's probably deployed. Um, think about how it can be abused, and think about the ways that admins notoriously fail. Admins will always do things like, if they're lazy, and every good admin should be, they'll probably put out a bunch of uh, batch scripts or shell scripts to do automatic updates or whatever else. The thing is, for those scripts to run, they probably have to have some sort of credentials, either hard-coded or just running as root or system, and now you've just identified something that has probably never been secured or reviewed, runs with credentials, and affects the systems you're interested in just because of you thought about how it was deployed. That's now a new target for you to attack in an operational review, right? You want to be thinking about all these things when you're, when you're sort of looking at the environment around the application. Um, other than that, you could also just beat the admin with a rubber hose, have them install some stuff, whatever. Drop some USB sticks around. I don't know. That's but yeah, that's uh. This is a graph slide. It shows you nothing. Um, <laughs> do we have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Not all at once. Oh, I'm sorry. So DLP stands for Data Loss Prevention. Thank you. It's an excellent point. Uh, data loss prevention, and it, it initially stood up, uh, it's being sold as a security product now, but in its initial formation as, as sort of a, a product, the goal was like, can you see when employees are trying to steal data, like their own data, like think company IP off the network. Maybe you're a trading company, and you've got this employee, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna email home all these awesome trading stats and trade on them at home or something, right? And so he'd email himself a PDF or a, or a document or something, and the DLP sits there, it's, it's like a network sniffer, and it sits there on the network and it taps all the data, and it's like, oh crap, look at this document going across. Oh god, it contains keywords like market data and, and trending and whatever else. I don't know. So that is a fundamental problem with DLP, and that's why it's a stupid product to begin with. Um, or you give the DLP product all your keys. Or you, or yeah, or you enforce it. So like, for example, it won't let encrypted data to go through. It just it'll inline block, and it'll allow. Like for example, you give it, you, you enforce certificates to be installed on every single browser, so you have to go over like SSL, it decrypts it in live time and you don't notice it. And if it, if it sees any sort of block of garbled data larger than a certain size, it, it gets screwed. But even then, yeah, you get, you know, you get all sorts of out of band. It, it, it doesn't, it's, yeah, terrible idea, I agree. But the thing is, lots of, lots of companies deploy it, and what they don't think about is, okay, it has to speak SSL, and how long have these guys that wrote the, the, the DLP product probably been writing SSL code? Since the DLP product's been around, a couple years, how long have, have the rest of us been writing SSL code? 20 years, how many bugs have there been in SSL? A lot. You think these guys wrote it better than the other people did when they like went, went home and like baked up their own little like homebrew SSL? And now, okay, so that's one thing, it's SSL. But now you also know it speaks like Word document formats. You know it speaks PDF formats. There's no vulnerabilities in those guys. And so like, so now that you know that it does all these things, and it has to do all those things, it becomes this massive, just glowing point of attack for you to go after. And what's even better is you know that all the network traffic goes through it because it has to for it to inspect everything. So you take over that and you pretty much get the gold of the whole network. And that was my tirade on that. But thank you for pointing that out. It's, it's, 
I assume, if I drop any acronyms that don't make any sense, um, it's probably because I haven't slept, but if I drop any acronyms you guys don't know, you should, uh, you should, you should raise your hand. Word. I mean, I think that's about it. We're right on time right now, I believe, for... Uh... Yeah, class officially ends at 8.15. Oh, it's 8.15? Well, yeah. so for homework, we're going to have you guys read through the first three chapters of the TAUSA, the Art of Software Security Assessment. Uh, really, really smart guys wrote that book. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's big and huge, though. I think Dan sent out a PDF. Yeah, I have PDFs. I'll send them out. So we're going to have all these, uh, all the stuff sent out tomorrow by 6 p.m. I think that's the goal. Uh, every week we'll have the homeworks announced Tuesday at 6 p.m. It'll be due a week later. Uh, so you'll have six days instead of seven, but it's, I don't expect you to go home now and like, type away on stuff, so I don't think it's a big loss. Um, but yeah, I have PDFs of the Tau SSA book, uh, and I'll send them out for all of you. The PDF is actually great because the book is like <coughs> like five by five by eight or something, and you can, you can actually use it for not only like security reviewing, but security defense and chuck it at people. So it's like, to so be happy sending you a PDF. Um, and then we'll have our short homework around architecture and design reviews. Yeah. We've got a small thing. If you guys review and pick apart, it's terribly broken. You should have fun doing it. Yeah. I sort of just take the slides. Really, really difficult, like hands on technical. Uh, we can. Yeah. So this is all really soft stuff to get you guys, like, the, the, the minds thinking around, all right, this is sort of how software is written or ways people commonly break it. We're, we're going to get into much more interesting hardcore stuff. This is, I realize this is, like, sort of soft and, and topical, but we get, in, we get into some awesome stuff. Okay, so I don't have any questions, only statements that were made on the Reddit. Thanks, guys, for the back. Uh, so if there aren't any questions, we can end the class now. There were two questions. What were the questions? Uh, Julian, would you like to speak the questions? Julian Cohen? Cohen's last name? Julian? <laughs> <laughs> no? I don't know. All right, whatever. I don't know. Okay. Either, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank Everyone you, guys. Go. I'll see you guys next week. All right. Don't unplug it.